Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and we're now here in Chapter 31, and this is Sponges, Cnidarians, Tenophores, and Protostomes. In Chapter 30, what we did there was introduce the animal kingdom and even explore animal evolution by way of the animal phylogeny. We also examined how systemicists use fossil morphology, developmental patterns, and molecular data to determine animal relationships. So keeping that in mind, in this chapter, we'll begin with an introduction to the sponges, the cnidarians, and tenophores, groups characterized here by asymmetry, radiosymmetry, and biradiosymmetry, respectively. The phylogeny of these animals is the focus of much current research. Although sponges, cnidarians, and tenophores are mainly small animals with simple body structures, they are of great ecological importance. They have complex relationships with many other organisms. For example, they are important members of marine food webs and some form symbiotic relationships with other animals. Many provide shelter for other organisms. Corals that produce reefs are among the most ecological ecologically important animals in the world. So once we finish our discussion with the sponges, cnidarians, and tenophores, we will then begin our survey of the bilateral animals, the most familiar ones and by far most numerous animals on earth. And of course, it's more than 99% of animal species belonging to the bilateria. So these diverse forms have adapted to life in most, almost every imaginable habitat in the ocean and in freshwater and terrestrial environments. So if you look in your textbook on page 641, you will see the Sally Lightfoot crab, and this is just an example of the diverse animals among the bilateria. So the remarkable success of bilateral animals can be attributed to the evolution of such adaptations. And as I speak to these adaptations here, they're including, of course, the facilitated food capture, escape from predators, and the re and reproduction. So, as I say this, among their key adaptations are cephalization, which is the formation of the head region, a central nervous system, muscles, a coelom, which I'll get to here later, being that body cavity, and compartmentalization of the body. So large animals developed body systems for gas exchange, and not just gas exchange, but also waste disposal and internal transport of nutrients, respiratory gases, wastes, and other materials. So please recall that based on molecular data, pattern of early development, and other data, biologists divide the bilateral animals into two main groups known as protostomes and Deuterostomes, which you all will contrast on your test, which is to come. The protostomes form two clades, and here in this chapter, we'll focus on the innovations in body parts, phylogenetic relationships, and life histories of several phyla of these two clades. So let us now begin on page 642 with sponges, cnidarians, and tenophores. And right before I get to this, we'll do a brief overview of animal characteristics just to ensure that nothing is forgotten or looked over. First things first, yes, animals are eukaryotes. Having cells lacking cell walls, we are, as animals, multicellular eukaryotes that are heterotrophs, gaining carbon for organics. And of course, you can also refer to chemotrophs, getting energy from chemicals, and of course, reproducing sexually. Body plans are as follows. As I mentioned these body plans here, just keep in mind that symmetry can be, of course, one of the three types with asymmetry, radial symmetry, and bilateral symmetry, which we'll get to a bit more formally here in a moment. And with those levels of organization, it all began class there with the cell. Groups of similar, of course, cells come together to form tissues. And then, of course, we have those four basic types of tissues. And, of course, when you have two or more tissues that come together, we, of course, then get what are known as organs. And, of course, those organs that work together class for that common goal form that organ system. So let's get back to where we are with animals. 
So here's a, a quick photo to show you the diversity of animals that we find here on Earth. Let us begin. So the animal kingdom, as you know it, of course, it includes a number of animals. So just keeping in mind from the 30th chapter that based on available evidence that animals and coenoflagellate, they shared this common coenoflagellate ancestor. And, and I say coenoflagellates is because this is that group of unicellular colonial protists. So many biologists assign sponges to a basal group known as the parazoa. And I don't want to get too specific with sponges, but what I'm stating here is, is of that one and a half million classified living things, approximately one million of those are animals, and approximately 300,000 of those are plants. So animals cannot make their own food. Hence, I mentioned they are consumers. And most animals move around from place to place. I said most, M-O-S-T, most. Animals, again, are multicellular and, of course, are classified yet on this single feature. Of course, their backbone or the, the lack of such a backbone. So, of course, all animals are classified as being either A, invertebrates class, or B, vertebrates. So, most animals exhibit symmetry. So, symmetry is defined as a balanced arrangement of body parts around that center point or center line. Center point class in the case of radial symmetry, and of course, that's the line in the case of lateral symmetry. So, as it states, radial symmetry radiates from a center axis point as opposed to bilateral symmetry, existing by slicing the animal in half longitudinally. If you look closely, class, here on the left, we have a radial symmetrical hydra. Notice that center point at which symmetry radiates from. So, you could cut this, I guess you could say, like a slice of pizza. That class is radial symmetry, as opposed to here in B class, shown in the crayfish with bilateral symmetry. So it can be cut class down this direction, and of course have those same structures on the other side. Again, we have symmetry, question mark. So I'll call this class A, and I'll call that class B. What type of symmetry is that in A? So if you look closely class there in A, I would hope that you say that that animal does not, of course, exhibit symmetry, as opposed to the bilateral symmetry class you see here exhibited there with B. Let us now continue. So here we are at the skeleton. So some animals have soft bodies, and of course, others of which have hard bodies. So to contrast those in such a way, what we're seeing here is, of course, animals of and, of course, differ in many ways, and not all of which have a skeleton. So looking closely here, we see the exoskeleton, or outer skeleton, and then last, well, excuse me, not lastly, but thereafter, is the endoskeleton, being that inner skeleton. And then finally, class, we have that hydrostatic skeleton, that fluid field compartment that is under pressure. So if you look closely here, it just shows a diversity of animals exhibiting class, those differing types of skeletons. So here to your immediate left class, the hydrostatic skeleton. There up above class, seeing that known as the XO skeleton. And then of course the endoskeleton class seen by way of echinoderms. Echinoderms from echinoderma. So now to tissue organization. So with tissue organization, I now get class to those germ layers. And as I mentioned the germ layers class, this deals with embryologic in, embryological development. So as the animals develop as embryos class, they will of course have either two to three germ layers. And those two to three germ layers class are what give rise to, of course, those differing tissues. So as you look closely class, Diploblastic animals have only an endoderm and an ectoderm. So what I'm getting to here is that the endoderm is what forms the, the lining of the digestive tube and other digestive structures. And the ectoderm class gives rise to tissue that form the outer covering of the body as well as nervous tissue. Triploblastic animals have all three germ layers. So yes, it's, the animal still has an endoderm and an ectoderm, but what is now included class is that mesoderm. And this class is what gives rise to most other body structures, which, which include the circulatory system when present, including skeletal structures 
and of course muscles. Next up class are body cavities. So there are three types of body cavities. First up class, let's just determine or at least describe what a body cavity is. So the mass majority of animals class have a body cavity or, or this thing known as a coelom. And I guess I should write that term. I said coelom. And that's what I'm referring to when I say body cavity. So it's just between class, the outer wall of the body and the digestive tract or digestive tube. So acylomates have no body cavity and tuple of which would be, of course, that I guess I'll say they have this, these animals have that soft body and are even triploblastic. And I'll get to examples here shortly. The pseudocylomates are a bit different in that the pseudocylomates have a body cavity that is not completely lined with mesoderm. And then you silomates, which we are, and we have a true coelom. So you call us silomates or you silomates. And that just means that the body cavity is completely lined, is completely lined. I say it is, is completely lined. And I mean it's completely lined class with mesoderm. So the coelom was one of the most important early animal adaptations. And this was a critical step in the evolution of larger, more complex animals. So this shows class the acylomites, those animals that don't have a body cavity at all. This class shows an example of a pseudo silomate looking closely class as that incompletely lined, incompletely lined body cavity. And then now you have the silomates. And I, I sometimes, or I think often, say it's kind of that tube. So that's the gut, the gut. So now I say it's a tube within a tube. So I'll now kind of draw around to show you what I'm saying. So it's a tube within a tube. Hence class the body cavity is called. So I just have further photos of animals, which I do indeed love the animals. And let's get to the gut. So when I refer to the gut of an animal class, I refer to, of course, whether or not the gut has one or two openings. Animals that have only one opening class are stated to have a gastrovascular cavity. And the animals that have two openings, i.e. a mouth and anus, are stated class to have a complete, a complete, a complete digestive a complete digestive tract and of course I learned it class being referred to as being an alimentary canal but of course you'll see it class described as a complete digestive tract so this class shows an animal that of course has a gastrointestinal cavity in the in here class on the left hand side this shows that medusa form and the medusa form of the animal class has the mouth part facing down so, of course, there is the gastrovascular cavity. What goes in class must, of course, exit. And on the right-hand side class, there is that polyp form. The polyp form. And with the polyp form, of course, the mouth part is facing up. And yet again, class, there is that gastrovascular cavity. Up next class, I have two examples showing the alimentary canal or that complete digestive tract with a mouth class and an anus. So, of course, it goes straight through, just as class we have here with our mouth class, and, of course, ultimately the anus, which would be there. So, one last thing I'll get to class would be just keeping in mind that there are some basic terms and directions that will help you when you locate body structures in bilaterally symmetrical animals. So, of course, the back surface of an animal is, of course, its dorsal surface, and the underside, or belly, is the ventral surface, and when it's referred to as being anterior, that means class toward the head of an animal, and posterior, or caudal class, means toward the tail end. And one last portion I'll get to class would be, of course, when it's referred to as being class I guess I'll say medial class would be toward the midline of the body, 
and lateral will be toward class the one side of the body being farther from that midline. So from here, class, let's get more formally to these animal groups, these phyla. So what I'm showing you here, class, is available in the module at Canvas. So if you navigate to Canvas and download this document, it is available, class, in both an Excel file as well as a PDF. So, of course, determine which of the two you'd like to download. I say download this class because throughout the next two chapters, being this chapter being 31 class and the next chapter being chapter 32 with the Deutero stones, this is what we'll go through. So I'll go through these characteristics class of the animals. And as I go through these characteristics, what you'll be tasked with doing is filling in these characteristics class per animal phylum on your lecture exam. I'll be honest. I will not class, I repeat, I will not ask for every one of these characteristics. I will not. However, there will be a subset of these phyla in which you will include those animal characteristics. In other words, it will be class to your benefit to work to learn this chart in its entirely, in its entirety. And I say that because if you don't, it very well will be that I pick something from this that you have not studied. So please prepare well and study well. Let us now begin. So I'll begin with phylum periphera. So here in this phylum class, I have examples, meaning the specimen here in this case class is the sponge. It says cyclone sponge. So as they are, they are class asymmetrical. They have no true tissues. Body cavity, they, of course, are acylimates having no body cavity at all. They have an endoskeleton. They have a gastrovascular cavity. They are hermaphrodites, of course, so that means they are hermaphroditic. And then, of course, they live class mainly in the marine environment. Photos are as follows. Let us now continue. So another photo. I love pictures of animals and just pictures in general. I'm Continuing on class of the next phylum. This phylum is phylum Nidaria. So there are a number of specimens here. So the sea anemone, the jellyfish, the hydra, and corals. They exhibit radial symmetry class. They are diploblastic acylimates with a hydrostatic skeleton. The body plan class here is that they exhibit a gastrovascular cavity, and there are two forms in which they come. The polyp form with the mouth, the mouth part facing up, and in this form is that that is sessile, as opposed to the medusa with the mouth part facing down, and this one class is free-floating. They have stinging cells known as nidocytes. They have stinging cells known as nidocytes. And they are mainly class marine animals. To the next phylum we shall go. So here I show pictures class of these animals. So we do class have the hydra. And another example class showing the very same. However, let's go to the far right hand corner here in which you see the polyp with buds. So the polyp with buds class eventually get to, of course, the larva, the ephyra larva. And then we get ultimately class to the adult jellyfish. So what happens is by way of this medusa, eggs and sperm are released into the water. From such class, we get the planula larva. That planula larva class is what develops from the fertilized egg. And then we ultimately class get yet again another class, polyp, which will give rise class to buds. This class shows the life cycle. And that's a sea anemone in the center. Another sea anemone is shown here. And of course, these are jellyfish. Next up, we have phylum tinnophora. Here we go. Tinnophorus class. So we have the comb jellyfishes and the sea walnut. They exhibit class what is known as biradial symmetry. Biradial symmetry. 
So they are diploblastic animals. They are acylomates with a hydrostatic skeleton. They have a complete digestive system with a mouth and two anal pores. They have a mouth and two anal pores. They exhibit what is known as bioluminescence, which I'll get to a bit more later on. And they have coloblasts. So coloblasts are not singing cells. These cells are, of course, adhesive cells that allow them to, of course, get food. Finally, class, they are marine animals. This class shows the their pores. Another photo class. And yet again, a picture. I told you, pictures are indeed one of my favorites. So now we get to the next phylum. This is phylum Platyhelminthes. Phylum Platyhelminthes. So here with phylum Platyhelminthes, examples are as follows. The liver fluke, the planarian, and tapeworm. They exhibit what is known as bilateral symmetry. And many of these animals are parasites. Next up, they are triploblastic A silomates with a hydrostatic skeleton. With a hydrostatic skeleton. The body plan here, they have a gastrovascular cavity, and they are monoecious, meaning that both male and female organs class are there on the same animal. They're found class in the terrestrial environment, including fresh water. Pictures are to come. So this class shows the planarian. Here, a liver fluke. This is spatula hepatica. And tenia pisiformis class, the tape worm. Next up is phylum mollusca. So examples class are so numerous. So we have the squids, the snails, the clams, the nautilus. I could go on and on. So they exhibit bilateral symmetry. They are triploblastic u silomates exhibiting a hydrostatic skeleton. They exhibit an, two openings, both the mouth and anus. Hence class, they have a complete digestive system. A complete digestive system. They have a soft body with a dorsal shell, which is secreted. Most have a radula, which is known as a belt of teeth. They live class on land, in the marine and freshwater environments. Here are photographs class showing bivalves from bivalvia. Of course, the cephalopod, gastropod, including class, another cephalopod. And of course, here to phylum annelida. So the annelids class are known as the segmented worms. The annelids are known as the segmented worms. The first worm phylum of three. So this includes the marine worms, the leech, earthworm, and clam worm. They exhibit bilateral symmetry. They are triploblastic eucylomates with a hydrostatic skeleton. They have an elementary canal, i.e. a complete digestive tract, excuse me. And... The key is that they are segmented. They are segmented. So they live in the marine as well as the terrestrial environments. These are examples of segmented worms with the leech, the nerus, and an earthworm at the top left. We're now to a further description class of the animal phylum. I love, excuse me. So we'll begin class with perfume. Periphera, and we'll start there again here. So keep in mind that you should prepare yourself to take notes, as of course, what we just did was just an, an overview of those characteristics, as you will find them class in the lecture test. Let's continue. Phylum nematoda, excuse me. We have two worm phyla, and a total of three. So examples class are the trachina worms, hookworms, and the ascaris class, which we will dissect. So they exhibit bilateral symmetry, and they are triploblastic pseudocylomates. Pseudocylomates. They have a hydrostatic skeleton. They exhibit a complete digestive tract class with a mouth and anus. They are cylindrical or cigar-shaped, and they are important as decomposers. 
These parasites class are terrestrial as well as aquatic, living in fresh water. There is last an example of an Ascaris. A nematode. Next up is phylum arthropoda. So this includes centipedes, spiders, crabs, crayfish, and even class those insects. I would say the most numerous animals animal group of all class insecta. They exhibit bilateral symmetry and they are triploblastic U silomates. They have an exoskeleton, a complete digestive tract with a mouth and anus. They have paired jointed appendages. Compound eyes are exhibited along with tracheal tubes for gas exchange. We find these class living, I say, all over the world, from the ocean to fresh water and the terrestrial environment. What helps you here, class, is that they have jointed appendages. Shown to you here, class, are just some examples, such as the red imported fire noted here, and the crayfish class labeled for you there. Mm. Head, thorax, abdomen. Now back to what I mentioned earlier, class, going through each of these individually, each animal group, perfra. So, of course, I could never ask you everything, class, from any chapter. So in this overview of each of these groups, keep in mind the characteristics that make each group unique. So phylum periphera. There is, here it includes class an approximate 8,800 species of sponges. I said 8,800 sponge species. Yes, they're mainly marine animals, and they're most abundant in, in warm waters. They have sac-like bodies that lack tissues. They're just that assemblage of cells, class, working together. And they have exhibit a wide diversity class in color, shape, and size. And sponges reproduce class asexually or sexually. So I mentioned that they range in size because they range from a few millimeters in size to more than class a meter in height and diameter, such as in the longer head sponges. So many of these class are asymmetrical, as mentioned, and these colors can range from purple to yellow, green, orange, blue, and red. And they may even be white or drab in color. So with that, I mentioned already that they have no true tissues. They're merely class an assemblage of specialized cells. So keep in mind that with that, sponges have flagellate cells known as collar cells or colonocytes. These collar cells or colonocytes, they line the inner cavity, and this is that indicator class for shared ancestry with the colonoflagellates. So these beating collar cells class that make up that inner layer of the sponges, they allow class that water current to be created. So again, I say the collar cells, the colonocytes, they develop that water current that brings in food and oxygen to the cells, and then they also carry away carbon dioxide into the wastes. So they also are here to trap and phagocytize food particles. So yes, they are filter feeders. So together, the collar cells of some sponges can pump a volume of water class equal to the volume of the sponge each minute. In other words, class, a ton of water for about an ounce of food. They, they're, they're pumping. So with that, just keep in mind that those currents that flow through those pores, i.e., Horocytes, i.e., the sponges, they ultimately class pump that water through that central cavity and out through their osculum or upper opening. So when I say osculum, I'm referring to class the structure that is there. That's the osculum. So of course they mentioned the coenoflagellate incest class. So water goes in and by way of those coenocytes and porocytes and ultimately class out the osculum. And we'll get to spicules in the lab. And to look at spicules, those spicules of the sponge look sort of like that. Or I guess maybe a better depiction of a spicule would be like this. But that's what the spicules look like. And I say spicules because, well, it, it's 
I guess you would say that the meso heel is supported by those slender skeletal spikes known as spicules. And that meso heel, of course, is that gelatin like layer. Thanks a lot, filter feeders known as sponges. So they feed plasma by drawing water into the body through the network of pores, hence the name, periphera, and they pass it through their osculum class at the other end of the body. Next up is phylum cnidaria. So the cnidarians class, as they are, include an approximate 10,000 species, and they're characterized by the adult body having radial symmetry. So with this, they have that typical hollow sac with the mouth surrounded by tentacles located on one end. So some cnidarians have a solitary existence, well, others of which, of course, form colonies, being colonial. Most of which are mentioned are marine, and here they are diploblastic. So they have stinging cells that eject a barbed thread and possibly some toxin. And it is only the Nidaria class that exhibit that have nidocytes. So here we see the Portuguese man of war. And what's shown to you, class, here is that nidocyte prior to the nematocyst being dis discharged. So we see, class, here the coiled nematocyst tube. And then upon the trigger being there, of course, the operculum door opens and the bing, the nematocyst is discharged. And this, of course, shows you what is happening here in that middle site. So just to help you out, class, it's it's the middle sites that contain those, of course, the thread capsules known as the nematocyst. So it's each middle site which projects its trigger on the outer surface that allows this to, of course, happen. So when stimulated by touch or some chemicals dissolved in the water, the nematocyst fires its thread. So just keep in mind that some nematocyst threads are sticky, and others of which class are long, and they coil around the prey. So the toxin that is, of course, ejected class may very well paralyze prey animals, such as small crustaceans. So the two body forms, as mentioned before class, are the medusa and polyp form, and both forms have tentacles arranged around the opening class. On the left class is that sessile, is that sessile polyp form. On the right-hand side class is the mobile, the one that moves class, medusa form. Next up is phylum tinophora, tinophora. The fourth class have eight comb rows and of, of fused cilia and they are arranged along the sides of the animal. So it is these cilia that beat in synchrony class and propel the tenophores through the water. So many of which have those long tentacles, but some lack tentacles completely. One thing that I will say is interesting about these that are here class known as the tenophores is that they are some pretty amazing predators. One thing I forgot to mention class is that here, there are an approximate 150 species of tenophores. An approximate 150 tenophore species. I'll now continue. So some of which are small as a pea, and others of which are larger than a tomato. So the tenophores are an important part of the plankton, as you all have heard. So other names class of tenophores will be, of course, Venus's girdles, sea walnuts, gooseberries, or just the comb jellyfishes. So, yes, there are, are no stinging cells class here in Tenophora. However, there are coloblasts, which are, of course, those sticky cells that allow them to catch the prey. And to finish things up, class, they exhibit what is known as bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. And, of course, this is why you can see these Tenophores, those free swing, of course, and they are, class, capable of self-fertilization. Next up is Phylum Plateomenthes. So these are now here part of the Lopatrochozoa. So these are otherwise classed known as flat worms. Notice, class, flat rhymes with flat for those, of course, here studying with me. So here, there are an approximate 20,000 species of flat worms. And they are subdivided into three classes. And to help you with those three classes, you can find those larger groups class being known as the planarians, the flukes, and tapeworms. So two of which are parasitic, 
and one class is free living, meaning the tubularians, the ta- the, the planarians, or the tubularians, whereas the trematodes include the monogenanes, which are flukes, and the cestodes class, or the tapeworms, the last two class being those that are parasitic. You can find this in Table 31.2. So as a whole, the adult body form class exhibits bilateral symmetry and cephalization, cephalization that development class of that head region with sensory organs. So it's many times class that the trematodes or the monogenes to include the flukes, which are either internal or external parasites. And the cestodes class are, as adults, intestinal parasites of vertebrates, meaning the tapeworm. And then the tubularians in the mentioned class just before are those that include the planarians and their relatives. So this shows you class, the typical flatworm. Notice the head region class. And then also notice the location of the pharynx class. Yes, the pharynx. And then here is the mouth. I'll now continue class with phylum mollusca. So here in mollusca, I say things class are getting more and more derived. Highly derived, I say. So as it gets to be more derived, I would tell you that the mollusks includes class more than 100,000 species in a variety of body forms and lifestyles. So the coelom is reduced and limited class to that region around the heart here in the mollusks. I've already given examples of which, but of course, examples includes the largest of all invertebrates class being, of course, the giant squid, which can get to class an approximate 53 feet in length, but it also includes slugs, oysters, and clams. So all mollusks have the following. Internal organs, a mantle that, of course, secretes a shell, a head and foot region, the radula class, which, of course, with rows of teeth, and a nervous system. In other words, it's typically to be that soft body covered by that dorsal shell composed of calcium carbonate. A broad, flat, muscular foot located ventrally, used for locomotion, Body organs, known as viscera, located class in that visceral mass, or at least concentrated class as a visceral mass, located above the foot. I've already mentioned class, the dorsal body, which forms that pair of folds, known as the mantle, which, of course, that mantle will be that sheet of tissue that generally overhangs the visceral mass, forming the mantle cavity. And, of course, the mantle then contains glands that secrete that shell. And the mantle cavity contains gills or a lung, a rasp like radula with that belt of teeth. And then, of course, that coelom, which I've already mentioned, class, but the main cavity typically being the hemocele, which is a space containing blood. And the hemocele class is not a coelom. Keep that in mind. So now let's get to the following. So we have that ancestor, and then we get to, of course, these differing groups. And as I, as I get there, we have the chitons, meaning, if you look here, there are the chitons, which I have examples of in the lab. We have those gastropods from gastropoda. And then thereafter, we have the bivalves from bivalvia, and the cephalopods from cephalopoda. So these are those four of those eight recognized clades. Up next class, we get to phylum Annelida. Annelida. So in phylum Annelida, this, of course, are those segmented worms. So they have the segmented bodies. Let's say again, they have those segmented bodies. And here, this allowed for the specialization of those functions in different segments. So the annelids have that enlarged coelom, which is to accommodate the, the more complex internal organs. And, of course, we have that fluid-filled coelom and the tough integument that, of course, acts as their hydrostatic skeleton. So, with these class being annelids, there are, are approximately 17,000 species that have been identified living in, of course, the marine, freshwater, and terrestrial environment. So, this shows class, quote-unquote, that typical earthworm, that typical segmented worm, Yes, they have a brain class. 
yes, there are hearts. We should be on lab tests. And of course, you see the, the segments listed there. And what are what else, excuse me, are listed are the sperm receptacles and of course the ovary that is there with oviducts and sperm ducts. So yes, this class was a cross section in which you can see the coelom class with other organs listed there. Next up is phylum nematoda. Nematoda. So here in this phylum, there are approximately 1,200, approximately 1,200 species here. And this does include ribbon worms. It does include ribbon, ribbon worms. So many nematodes class are predators that feed on crustaceans or even class annelids. At any rate, class, most are free living with a few being parasitic. So nematodes, they lack a circulatory system. However, class, upon dissection, you will see that there is a very well-developed digestive system. A very well digestive system. So this shows a, a bit of an overview class, but I would say this does not do it justice class because of under section you will see that it's a lot more inside. So as I mentioned earlier, there is no heart and blood is simply circulated class by contractions of the muscular blood vessels by moving the body. Because as I mentioned earlier, they lack that circulatory system. So this class shows the, the Ascaris lumbricoids. Here class is the male to, to, of course, identify whether that is male or female class. Look for this hook. If that hook is there, that is a male. And people which classes for that female, look at it here, to be larger than the male. Next up is phylum Arthropoda. So as we get here class to phylum Arthropoda, I say I'll take my time here just a bit. And the reason to say this class here from the Excadidoso is 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 because as I get here to the nematodes with well I just mentioned that there are approximately twenty five thousand nematode species which we just finished. What I'm going to state is I'm now class to arthropods in phylum Arthropoda. So here with arthropods. What I will state is, I guess what I'll get to as being I'm going to go back to phylum nematoda just a moment. So here in phylum nematoda, there are approximately 25,000 nematode species. Tip of which is they are, there are soil nematode species, but of course these being the round worms, which of course, which are typically called the nematodes, is the tail row class as being parasites, decomposers, and even predators. So with that being the case, the nematodes found in the soil mainly are going to be cylindrical, and not just cylindrical class, but they're cylindrical and pointed at both ends. So they have this fluid field pseudoseal and hydrostatic skeleton. So that this is what transmits the, the, the force from their muscle contraction class that is enclosed in the fluid. So like ribbon worms mentioned earlier, the nematodes exhibit bilateral symmetry and a complete digestive tract. So they have no circulatory system and the sexes, of course, are typical than meaning that the male has the hook on the tip and the female is larger than the male. So although most nematodes are free living, others are important as parasites, including the, Ascar the Ascaris, which you all dissect. And of course, hookworms are an example of nematodes too. Now to phylum arthropoda. So phylum arthropoda class are the most biologically successful groups of animals. And to say another way class, more than 80% of all known animals are arthropods. Hello, over a million living arthropod species exist, and we have not, or they have not all been named yet. So it's predicted that biologists will, of course, identify class millions more arthropods. So if you would like to be a biologist class, please study insects from class Insecta. 
So the other part body, it's like that of the annelid and it is, is segment. So segmentation is important from that evolutionary perspective in that it, pro it provides the opportunity for specialization of those body regions. So in arthropods, it's groups of segments are specialized to perform their particular functions. So those segments, they differ in shape. So, and of course, muscles and even the appendages it's with it bare. Seeing here class segmentation. Not just that, but also that hard exoskeleton class where that is composed of chitin and protein. So it encapsulates and covers the entire body and appendages. As I continue here, it's that exoskeleton that serves as a coat of armor that protects against predators and helps prevent excessive loss of moisture. It helps prevent what is known as desiccation. So it also supports the underlying soft tissues. So arthropods move effectively because the distinct muscles attach to the inner surface of the exoskeleton and they operate the joints of the body and appendages. As I continue, there is a disadvantage of the exoskeleton and of course it is that it is that the that it's non-living and the arthropod periodically outgrows it. So if you think back, it's molting, meaning the process of shedding an old exoskeleton which is replaced by a larger one. So that shed exoskeleton represents a net metabolic loss and molting also leaves that arthropod temporarily vulnerable to predators. What makes them amazing, of course, would be those paired jointed appendages. And I'm saying that because this is, of course, from which this group gets its name, arthropod, jointed foot. So they are modified for many functions and they serve as swing paddles, walking legs, mouth parts for capturing and manipulating food, sensory structures, and or organs for transferring sperm. I'll also mention that they have that nervous system, meaning that it resembles that of the annelids and consists of a brain. It also includes a ventral nerve cord with ganglia. So in some arthropods, successive, successive ganglia may fuse, and the arthropods have a variety of effective sense organs, and many have antenna, well antennae, excuse me, being plural, that sense taste and touch. And most insects and crustaceans have compound eyes, composed of many sight-sensitive units called omomatidia. And it's by way of that that the compound eye class can form an image especially adapted for detecting movement. What else I'll get to class is that arthropods have an open circulatory system. They have a dorsal tubular heart that pumps the hemolymph into the dorsal artery, which of course branches into smaller arteries. And it's from these arteries that the hemolymph flows into the large spaces and collectively make up the hemocele. So eventually the hemolymph renders the heart. The openings called ostia within the walls. So the exoskeleton class prevents a, presents excuse me, a barrier to diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide to the body wall, so they have specialized respiratory systems for gas exchange. So in most aquatic arthropods, there are gills that function in gas exchange, and in contrast to the terrestrial forms that have a system of internal branching air tubes called tracheae or tracheal tubes. And other terrestrial arthropods have plate-like book lungs. And then finally, arthropod digestive system. Here, class, it's a tube similar to that of earthworms. And then the excretory stru structures, they vary somewhat among the groups. And the coelom is a small fluid-filled cavity. And, of course, it's by way of the organs of the reprodu reproductive system. So next up, just keep in mind that they have those zones called the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Such as you see, head, thorax, abdomen. And this class has been the chapter. And I say this, and just keep in mind, class, that as you prepare for your exam, you should be able to, of course, describe each, of course, group by way of what's been given, meaning what makes each group of animals, I say, unique. Because as I mentioned to, to start the chapter, that it, it, it's not that I can, of course, test you on every part of the chapter, every piece and every part. However, you should be able to, of course, take what you're given here and use that class to be able to describe these animal groups as they are because each group is unique. And of course, I've gone through those portions here. So please use the textbook and of course, use this lecture as it was given. So this has been your instructor, Skylar Huff, and this has been chapter 31. 
Next will be chapter 32. And if you have any questions, class, please stop by the office. Call me. Email me, of course. I'm here to help you. Thank you all, and have a great day.